Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you all. It's great to be here with the family. It's good to be able to be together on the Lord's Day. So um, today I want to um, take a few moments. Let's um, let's start with a thought experiment. Think for a moment. What is valuable to you? Why is it valuable? In your head, in your mind. I wouldn't ask anybody to close your eyes because I don't want anybody to fall asleep. But when you picture what's valuable to you and why is it valuable? Do you see family? Do you see loved ones? Friends? Your Bible? You know, what goes through your head? And then if we took a moment and we flipped that, what if we saw it from God's perspective? What does God see as valuable? You ever imagine basically what does God see? What's important to God? What does he value of us? What is the, the big big rocks, the things we've got to look for? And how do we know what's important to God? How do we know what he values? And how do we reconcile things in the Bible that we find like there's seven chapters in the book of Leviticus discussing very explicit and exacting details of sacrifices. Very, very, very details. Now, compare that with Jacob way back in the book of Genesis, before there was a Levitical law, sacrificing without any of the things they had, all those commandments, all those rules. And on top of that, how do you reconcile that with in the book of Isaiah, God saying that he does not delight in sacrifices? So which is it? Does God want extreme formality? Does he want the very explicit and exacting details of the sacrifices? Does he want something else? Is it the process or the result that's valued? And for a sampling of the first book, let's take a look at this. Let's kind of dig in a little bit. For a sampling of this, let's go to the book of Leviticus. And now, just to let you know, this is part about sacrifices. So it's talking about basically cutting up animals. It's a slaughterhouse. So just to forewarn you before we get into this. But this is a little bit of sampling of what you find in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 1, 10 to 13. In Leviticus 1, 10 to 13, it starts off. If his offering is of the flocks, of the sheep or of the goats, as a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring a male without blemish. He shall kill on the north side of the altar before the Lord and the priests. Aaron's son shall sprinkle its blood all around on the altar, and he shall cut it into its pieces with his head and its fat. And the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and legs with water. Then the priest shall bring it all and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. That's pretty explicit. And I know some of you are cringing because you're thinking about cutting up those baby animals. But, you know, <laughs> it was food and it was a sacrifice. But that was very explicit, very detailed. Why was that? Why did, he, why did God give us these laws, these, these books in Leviticus? I mean, sacrifice had to be done with the killing on the north side of the altar, very specific part washing, cutting, the burning specific, by specific persons. Is this what God values? And if so, if it is, how could Abel make an acceptable sacrifice, and also Jacob back in the book of Genesis, for the books of law were written? And without these explicit instructions, how would that work? So let's take a look way back at the very beginning, back in the book of Genesis. We read Genesis 4.1. Genesis 4.1, it reads, And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord respect in Abel and to his offering. Wait a second. Abel broke the rules, right? There's no north side of the altar. There's no priest. What's going on here? You know, should we take him away, lock him up? It's horrible. Why did he do that? How could he do this? It doesn't fit the biblical law. But if you think, there were no rules at this point. This was really, really way back at the beginning. The earth was brand new, and honestly, so were people. There was no temple. There were no Levites, no altar, or even a map to know which way would be labeled north. So, what was there? Why then was Abel's sacrifice acceptable? Well, we do know that Abel brought his first and his best to God to thank him before he took any for himself. Abel showed a love and respect for God. 
Well, let's look at another instance. What about Jacob? Let's turn to Genesis 31:54. Genesis 31:54, and this is Jacob's sacrifice before the law was Moses was written down by Moses, or Moses was even born. In Genesis 31:54, it reads, "Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread, and they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain." Well, what was offered? In what way? We don't know what was offered, but it's a safe bet that it was the best that Jacob had to offer to be acceptable. Other than this, we don't know what it was or how it was offered. We do know that it was not offered exactly as written in the books of law written by Moses or Aaron, because Moses wasn't even born yet to, write, to receive the law to write it down. But again, there's a love and respect for God. Jacob, at this point in the Bible, of the book, Jacob had just settled a dispute with Laban. Laban had been chasing him across the country, and they just basically settled that dispute. And so the first thing Jacob does is thank God. That's the first thing he went to. That's the first person he thought of. That's what he was. So we know that there was a love and respect for God. And we notice that a love and respect for God is always present when acceptable actions are taken. Well, those are sacrifices without the law. What about when they had the law? What about when they were following the law to a T and everything was just right? Let's turn to Isaiah and Isaiah 1. And as you read this, think about what God is saying, about what practices that were originally meant to honor him. So to me, this is fairly interesting because I would assume if something was done in the name of God, God would approve, right? But let's see what Isaiah has to say about this. Isaiah 1, starting in verse 11. As they won, verse 11 reads. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure. Iniquity in the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. And this is pretty harsh, right? So you've got... Um, you're reading this thing, you're thinking, okay, these guys are doing what they're supposed to. It seems like the fire, you know, the fury would be coming down on Abel because Abel had no north side of that, the, the altar. But it was these folks who used the north side of the altar and the Levitical laws and practices that were getting this. Now notice how God mentions the Sabbath, a holy day that the Israelites wanted to keep. Also the moon festivals, which were meant to be holy festivals, that the Israelites followed, such as by Solomon when he built the temple. Turn over to Second Chronicles, and we'll read about one of these things being instituted. In Second Chronicles 2, 4, Behold, I am building a temple for the name of the Lord, my God, to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense, for the continual showbread, for the burnt offerings, morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the set feast of the Lord, our God. This is an ordinance forever for Israel. And notice this. This is something they were setting out. They were doing this to honor God. But God was saying he hated the ceremonies. He hated those things. There was iniquity, a sin. So why was he saying this What this was his way? And that's a, I think that's a really strong word that he used, hate. The God of love is using the word hate for even these feasts. Why would God hate a ceremony? That was supposed to honor him. And so for a bit of history on these verses, if you're not familiar with the rise and fall of the Israelites, this passage was written toward the end of the Israelite kingdom. When the people had lost their ways, and introduced for idol worship. Now, if you know about this, when you have idols, God is no longer your king. He was no longer your sovereign. And that's what it was for them. They were going to these practices. They were doing the Levitical law. They had the north side of the temple. They had their priests decked out in guard roads. Everything was working just clockwork. And there's no love. There's no respect. There's no thankfulness. They were going through motions. And God was not being honored. There was not a love of God in this. And so let's look back 
for Isaiah 112. Notice it says in Isaiah 112, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? So just God saying, you show up here, but do you know why? <laughs> Similar to us in this day and age, some people come to church but don't really know why. Or even worse, there's some that choose not to come to church and don't really know why. And you know, right now, all across this nation, there's an argument going on right now. All across the world, people are debating, what is church? Does it count if it's online? Do we have to go to the building? Are we obeying man more than God to meet if we don't meet in a physical location? How do we view this battle of this day and age in the light of what we just read about these people in Isaiah? These people are going to the right location at the right times, but for all the wrong reasons. Was the location and time what was important to God? Well, judging by what we just read, it certainly was not, as God was really steamed these folks. God was preached, God is always very straightforward and doesn't really beat around the bush about things. He makes what he wants really simple and really straightforward. So let's read on in Isaiah to see what else God says. So this is on later on in the, the same chapter, chapter one, verse 16 and 17. 16, it reads, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings before my eyes, cease to do evil. Now, I always imagine God at this point basically putting a, a gentle kind of hand of the head motion, a gentle love tap going, wake up, stop it. <laughs> I know God would never do that, but I imagine he's wanting to do that to these people right here. Because basically, cease to do evil, stop what you're doing. But then... Look what he says when he has their attention. He says this. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. That's interesting, right? What is God saying at the end of verse 17 in Isaiah 1? Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Doing well is not some formal ceremony that doesn't help anyone. It's certainly not a location in time. It starts off becoming holy, becoming like God, and with doing work that makes life better for others and caring for others, and echoes the two greatest commandments of love your neighbor, or love God and love your neighbor. Now, two more passages. Let's go to Jeremiah. And for the context of what Jeremiah's, for the context, Jeremiah starts as a prophet towards the end of the Jewish kingdom of Judah. And he's communicating here what God says. That if they would do what he says, they would let him stay and not be taken to captivity by Babylon. So let's read Jeremiah 7, 1 through 7. In Jeremiah 7, 1 through 7 reads, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter in these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. This is definitely not saying the location was important, right? The temple was a super opulent place. Gold everywhere, precious stones, beautiful carvings. It was just impressive to see. It was prime real estate. God was not impressed and clearly states that the location, the building, was not what he cared about. What did God care about? And what did the people want to do? What do you want the people to do? Again, God's command was for them to care for others and do good works. There's no no side of the altar or how things are washed, but our relation to God, how we treat others is what is important, what is wanted by God. In these examples in the book of Genesis, before the local law was written by Moses and the passages of the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, the relation to God, the relation to others, what's focused on. Now, this is the Old Testament. What if we go to the New Testament? Let's go to Paul. So, one last example from the New Testament. In the book of Romans, where Paul is speaking to the Jews living in Rome. 
Let's turn to Romans 2, verse 14 and 16. In Romans 2, verses 14 and 16, it reads, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Now, same chapter, skip on down to verse 25 and read a little bit more. Romans 2:25. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, does uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirement of the law? Will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are transgressed of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So, how can you do by nature the sacrificial rituals described in the many books of Leviticus, where even the side of altar used could be an issue? Honestly, you cannot. It would be impossible. You wouldn't know all those details. You wouldn't even have an altar. So. Ceremony, times, dates, physical occasions are not what's important to God. If they were, that is what he would have told his prophets to speak about. That is what he would have instructed Paul to speak about. Get to the temple at 9 a.m. Never said by any prophet. The temple knew the time was what was important. Now, if you think about it, most importantly, God would not have sent his only son to do away with such things by the, being the end of all sacrifices, if this was what was important to God. If very explicit and rigorous animal sacrifices, practices, locations, dates and times are not what's important to God, what is? Also, why did God give so much direction on something that wasn't important to him? Well, for us, because God loves us. This is the exact reason he sent his son to endure what he did and save us. This message has been the same from the start of the Bible to the very end of it. Let's go back to the very beginning of things. Deuteronomy 10.21. I know this is a, a lot on your screen, but um, this is about the very beginning of the Old Testament. And look what God says. Deuteronomy 10, verse starting verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God and walk in all his ways and to love him. To serve the Lord with you, God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, the heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples, as it is this day, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who no, shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise, and he is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Now, note in verse 13, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee from your day for your good. That's why he gave those details. That's why there was so much rigorousness in the Levitical law. God told the people how to slaughter animals, be sanitary, govern the community, to give the people a way to live healthy and full life, to be able to serve and love him. If you're ever stuck on a deserted island with no survival manual, pull out the Old Testament, and it would tell you what to eat, how to maintain sanitary conditions, how to form a community, other essential items. God was basically saying, here's what you can do to live, to survive. This is why there were such explicit details in the political law. 
God was telling them how to people to form a just society and stay healthy. Now, let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to a very famous verse, John 3, 16 and 17. And we will probably all know this by heart, hopefully. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son of the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. God loves us. This is what is important for us to know. This is the basis of everything. Matthew 22, 35 through 36 through 40. Let's read this one. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He wants us to love him and each other. This is what is important for us to do. It's so important that God incarnate Jesus so that that premise is what all the law and the writings of prophets is based upon and depend on. That basically sums up the whole Bible in just a few verses. So one last passage. Mark 2, 23 through 38. Or 23 through 28. Again in verse 23. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do that? that is not, what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Everything that God tells us to do is for our own good. This is what is meant by the Sabbath made for man, not man, not man for the Sabbath. God is all-powerful. He created all things. There is nothing that we can give or do for him except that he's given for us. From the Levitical laws to Jesus' commandment to love one another as he loved us, God is telling us for our own good. We can either take away or add to God by anything that we do. In a way, it's kind of helpless. Then we can't give anything to God since it's all his to begin with. But in another way, it's actually very liberating. The God of the universe, the God Almighty, having all things, chooses to love us, even though we cannot give him anything that's already his. That's pretty incredible. So we have a choice. And there's one thing that we can give, to, that God did give over to us, though. And it's the only thing that we do have is our decision, our free will. Do we choose to return the love that he has for us? There are sections of the Bible that go into extreme detail about the procedure, such as the animal sacrifices, the size of the altar to use. When it comes down to essentials and what God is really looking at and what his priorities are, he lays it out very plainly, very simply. Love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that sums up pretty much the whole Bible. And anyone can understand this and do this. So briefly back to Leviticus, the north side of the altar. Why was the north side of the altar specified in such detail? So, based on what we know, and what we can tell about the Bible, on the western side, this is in the tabernacle. On the western side of the altar was a tabernacle. On the eastern side, according to Leviticus 116, was a heap of ashes. On the south side was probably the stairs going up to the altar. On the north side, there's believed to be some open space between the altar and the wall of the court. So basically, the north side was the most convenient place for the slaying of animals. Otherwise, nothing really special about it. So, some final questions for we wrap up for the day. Why do we come here? And what is the purpose? 
if the answer is it's some formality we do without thinking about it, or it's just something that we've always done, please revisit Isaiah 1. See how happy God was with those folks who viewed, viewed God like this. Why do we come here? Hopefully the answer is an easy one. It's one and it's out of your heart. Hopefully the answer is because of the deep love of God. Well, what is the purpose? The ceremonies that we do. The Lord's Supper, the singing, the praying, someone getting up and talking. The main focus is to do them first and foremost with the love of God in our hearts. Otherwise, they mean nothing or worse, they're sin. God loves us and is looking out for us in all that he directs us to do. Do we choose to let the physical circumstances keep us from loving God? All means no. Do we worship God with our hearts, any less if we are online, in a cave, in a jail, in someone's basement? No. Wherever we are at, whatever circumstances are, let us never forget what is important and what our priorities should be. Let us not get caught up in the ignorance of God's word or the folks who are arguing about physical locations as if that was something that was important to God. We know very well from what Isaiah and Jeremiah told the people about the locations, buildings, physical things, ceremonies. That's definitely not what is important to God. Let us always worship God with all that we are, no matter the time, the place, the circumstances. Let us love each other as ourselves. This is what is important to God. Our love for God and for each other should never stop. Meaning virtually may be an inconvenience in some ways. And I'd love to be able to hug the rest of you. I miss being able to do that. But this is also an opportunity. God is not stopped by inconvenience or anything at all. And neither does his work ever stop. Meaning virtually or anywhere in God's hand can lead to many good things. For example, the online worship. The commute is great. All few feet of it was easy, and I hugged the traffic as they passed by. Not bad at all. For me, I get to worship with both sides of my family. And even though they don't live on the other side of the continent, I can look and see my parents on both sides, and my cousins, my, nep my nephew, both my nephews. It's awesome. We've got, uh, I think uh, Lamar from Texas m may have joined us today, but we've got a lot of folks from all over the country be able to join us. We have that opportunity. We can invite anyone to services right now, no matter where they are. Have a cousin or friend in New York, Texas, Montana, South Carolina, Southern California, see if they want to come. We can share God's love with people all over the world. We no longer have a physical location holding us back from doing so. Now, this isn't to say that meeting a physical location is bad. That's not what's being said. What is being said is it's irrelevant where we meet. What is important is worshiping God. Physical, virtual, wherever. We have a great God, and he can make anything turn out for good. Let us turn to God. Remember why we are here and what is important to God. And this is what's important to God. It's the reason Jesus said it. Love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we have that decision, the most important decision. Do we choose to love God back? If you haven't made that decision and would like to do so, please let us know as we sing the invitation song or any time really. Anytime, the sooner the better is the right time to choose to love God. He already loves us, and he's shown us throughout all of history, through the giving of his life of Jesus, as Jesus on the cross, through how he takes care of us in our lives. It's only right to choose to turn the love that God has already shown to us. Thank you all for listening. God bless.